Tonight we are being recorded by Wacam for rebroadcast and also it's being broadcast live. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening and a very special welcome to the Gossels family who are here with us tonight. My name is Richard Turner and I am the chair of the Public Ceremonies Committee. I have served on this committee since 2003. I am also a 20-year veteran of the United States Navy and a Purple Heart recipient. I and my fellow committee members, George Bernard, Rod McLean, Donna Bouchard, and Cynthia Miller are charged with the duty to oversee Wayland's public ceremonies, including Memorial Day and Veterans Day. We are honored to recognize Wayland veterans, past and present, in ways to ensure that they are never, that they are never forgotten. Other days of remembrance include Vietnam War Veterans Day, Purple Heart Day, and special occasions such as coordinating flags for the graves of our fallen heroes. And as a representative of the Public Ceremonies Committee, I assisted in the construction of two flag disposal boxes for an Eagle Scout project and our committee's mission is a great privilege and most humbling. In addition, the Public Ceremonies Committee is charged with recognize, recognizing those who have selfishly given back to the town. In years past, we have recognized these citizens through the Lydia Maria Child Award bestowed annually upon a Wayland resident, local group, local volunteer organization, and an, or employee of the town in recognition of their active volunteer leadership in the betterment of our community's quality of life or in serving, in, or in serving the important needs of our townspeople. Tonight we are honored to introduce a new annual award, Wayland C. Peter R. Gossels Award of good governance. Our dedication ceremony has been somewhat delayed by the pandemic. This day also happens to coincide with another special reason to celebrate today. Today would have been Peter's 91st birthday. Happy birthday, Peter. We know you are here with us in spirit tonight. To say that Peter touched the countless lives is an understatement. Those who had the pleasure to know him, and I suspect there were many of you, hold on to dear memories that will live in our hearts forever. As you already know, Peter, like me, served his country and was a member of the United States Army from 1954 to 1956. In 2003, before I took the podium to announce the winner of the Lydia Maria Child Award at town meeting, Peter made a, a special introduction remembering me as a 20-year Navy veteran who served on a riverboat in Vietnam and saw a lot of action, I am still deeply touched that Peter took the time to get to know me so thoughtfully and acknowledge the difficulties I experienced while serving my country. Peter himself experienced an un unfathomable adversity along with his younger brother, Werner. Despite all this hardship, both brothers emerged as an inspiration to us all and Peter remains a beacon of great hope and optimism. After dedicating the serving after his, after dedicating his life serving the needs of others, shortly after moving to Wayland in 1961, Peter went on to serve in Wayland Town government for 50 years. He was a member of the finance committee from 1966 to 1968. 
He then served as Wayland's town council for 11 years and was first elected town moderator in 1982. Peter held the gavel at Wayland's town meeting for the next 30 years until his retirement in 2011. Starting in 1998, Peter hosted a cable television program, Ask the Candidates Live, which allowed Wayland voters to call in and learn more about the candidates for local public office. Even, even with Peter's incredible workload and volunteer schedule, he made time to assist the Public Ceremonies Committee in honoring our veterans. He gave the keynote address at the 2013 Wayland Veterans Day program and was also the Master of Ceremonies at the 2015 and 2017 Veterans Day program. Although all U.S. citizens enjoy the freedoms, precautions, protections, and legal rights of, that our Constitution and Bill of Rights promise. Some citizens also feel a responsibility to ensure that those democratic values are upheld. Peter exemplified civic duty, his great admiration for our nation's founding fathers, and the effort that began at Lexington and Concord to establish our independence inspired P Peter's lifelong commitment to the preservation of good government. Tonight we honor Peter with the dedication of the C. Peter R. Gossel's Good Government Award to be bestowed on a longtime resident of Wayland who has served as a volunteer for 20 years or more with generosity of spirit to improve and support the operation of good town government. This award will honor unpaid secular service that promotes positive citizen engagement with town government and provides information to voters and officials to enhance fairness, well-informed decisions and may recognize innovative initiatives to enhance the operation of the town of Wayland. The award will the award will annually recognize an individual who exemplifies Peter's passion for justice, civil solidity, and high standards of conduct. Words cannot express how grateful we have known are to have known Peter. He epitomized goodness, justice, fairness, kindness. We love and miss Peter. And we thank the Gossels family for per permitting us to commemorate this memory for such a remarkable person. And his exceptional accomplishment through this annual award. We also invite you, all of you, who joined us tonight to share our pers your personal memories of Peter with his wonderful family members while enjoying some light refreshments at the conclusion of this dedication ceremony. Thank you all again. Thank you. I will now turn the microphone over to Ms. Cherry Carlson, the Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Richard, and thank you to the Public Ceremonies Committee and to the Gossels family for um, inviting me to be here to say a few words tonight on behalf of the Board of Selectmen. There are many of us who had the privilege of working with Peter um, during his years of service here in Wayland. It's hard not to be personal when you, when you talk about Peter, and I go back to, um, I met him. We all tell our stories of when we moved to Wayland, but you know, I moved to Wayland in 96, and we started going to town meeting, and I got to watch Peter from the various chairs that we chose to sit in during town meeting and the various configurations of those chairs in the, in the high school um, gymnasium, the field house. Um, but it wasn't until I joined FinCom, um, I took the seat in 2004, that I really got to start seeing Peter in action um, from one of the front tables at town meeting, which is a little different than when you're sitting out um, as a resident. 
And it helped me to finally have an understanding of the preparation and the patience and the understanding that went into his work as town moderator. He liked good, informed town government. He wanted residents to have information to inform their votes right there on town meeting floor. Um, he insisted on rules of conduct that kept the conversation civil. And he did it with decorum. He will always have a three-piece suit on in my my knowledge, as he does in his in the plaque in the in the um, the photograph, um, but decorum, grace, and he had a twinkle in his eye. I, I would love, so you know, he would stand here, and FinCom was to this side, and there would be a question, and he would look over, and I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm digging for the information, but I've got it, and um, or there were some residents that were in the front row, I know some are here tonight, who would also you know, know a point of order, how to deal with it, he'd look to them. He wanted people to have the right information. And um, I was honored and flattered to be one of the people that he looked to for that. Um, but those of you who know me, he liked people who were prepared. He liked the information, he wanted it there. Um, when I ran for the Board of Selectmen, then I got to see Peter on his turf when I had to go to the Ask the Candidate interviews. And yeah, and you're laughing because you know. And he would be really nice and he'd send a list of the topics and it would go like for three pages. And there was no way you could prepare and he would send it, I think the night before the interview. So there was no way you could prepare. And you would show up and he was a jovial host, you know, making you comfortable and everybody had water and, and you know, it was all chatty and the candidates were all there sweating and ready. And as soon as it started, the gloves were off. Every question was fair game. It didn't matter. He was, um, didn't matter what he thought of a topic. He asked the questions um, and they were tough. And I was always glad when that was over and we could go back to being friends again. And I wouldn't have to do that again for three more years. Um, Peter and Nancy happened to live not very far from our home and we frequent the same grocery store. And one of my favorite things on a personal level is Peter took the train in and out of the Lincoln station and for some reason I would never be doing my grocery shopping until the end of the day and he would be there waiting for Nancy to come get him and if it was a little inclement he'd be inside poking around and we'd chat in the produce section or in the deli section and it was lovely to get to know someone um, outside of town government just as casual chats and even though we were standing in the grocery store so it is one of my fondest memories of Peter is standing in the grocery store in Lincoln so um, I have to say when Donna Bouchard um, reached out to me, it has to be close to two years ago now when um, this was getting underway and I was chairing the Board of Selectmen at that point and we talked about the process of bringing this through um, the Board of Selectmen and um, Richard reached out to me as well and that was an easy yes, let's get this done, let's bring it through um, and it was an easy vote for the Board. And I know here tonight we have um, some former Selectmen who are part of that vote and some current Selectmen as well who um, you know, are, are very supportive of that. When the, the plaque and the portrait were finally ready, um, we were in the midst of COVID and Richard was able, or someone was able to deliver them to town building, but we couldn't do much to get them posted. And with Richard's gentle urging, we did get them um, hung in, in the hallway where you were able to see them this evening and I could take a picture and send it. And at that point, that was really all we could do and provide, but to show that they were up and um, being appreciated and Peter was looking down the hallway and smiling at all of us. So I'm very happy that we can be here tonight and people can um, see them in their glory and for real and that we're back in town building wearing masks again, but that's okay. So as I said, tonight's my honor to be here both for myself and on behalf of the Board of Selectmen for this unveiling and for the very beginning of what will be the Gossel's Good Government Award history. Um, and I say, here's to Peter's mission of, as you use these words, generosity of spirit, his fairness, and the passion for good government. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. We will now have uh, Mr. Dennis Berry come up here, our town moderator, to say a few words. Thank you, Richard. If and to the extent that I'm remembered at all, I fear that I'm going to be remembered as, oh, he's the guy that followed Peter Gossels. <laughs> a few years from now, it'll be a trivia question in Whalen Trivia. Who's him? Let me say a few things about Peter. Peter set the standard, literally and figuratively. 
Literally, he wrote the rules. You wouldn't believe how many other communities have a, a moderator works out of, the, out of his back pocket or has a few couple pages of rules. Not Wayland. Wayland has a well-written set of, beautifully written set of rules. As I've said on many occasions, uh, Peter wrote a symphony. I've added a few riffs. Uh, well, there was a meeting of the Mass Moderators Association just a few years ago. And a moderator from another town, I won't say which one, is proudly showing off his newly written set of rules for this town meeting. I looked at them. We had this 15 years ago. I didn't say that, but Peter was ahead of his time on that. Figuratively, Peter's procedures are the procedures I use. Many of you who have seen me at town meeting, you know that I pretty much follow the figurative script. Town meeting time, that's the Bible of all moderators, doesn't say you have to bang the gavel when you uh, close an, uh, an article, declare an article that's disposed of. But I want to tell you, if I didn't bang the gavel when I would dispose of an article, there'd be seven people demanding that gavel come down. That's what Peter said. Nobody, I don't know any other moderator says that, is there anything else to say in that article? Peter did, so I did. Incidentally, we disagree on what that means, but that shows that two people don't agree on everything. Another incident I had a few years ago with a moderator, uh, Wayland has a rather comprehensive and rather sophisticated uh, article, an uh, item in the moderator's rules, dealing with reconsideration. Now that's something that every moderator talks about and worries about, is reconsideration. So I was chatting with another moderator and I told him, well, yeah, here's, I explained Wayland's rather sophisticated. Would this help? Can everybody hear me? I have used it here pretty well. Uh, it's part of the job. Uh, so I, I said it's a rather sophisticated and difficult uh, to apply reconsideration article. Very sophisticated. I said it was written by Peter Gossels. He looked at me and said, knowing Peter, I would expect nothing less. He was respected by his peers. Uh, he had strength. Not too long ago, there was an item up at town meeting where there was a board. They were, they were trying to find every way, to get, every way from Sunday to get around having a vote. Peter knew it was going, we were going to vote. Peter knew the people knew the issues. I've on several occasions, as I sat there, I wondered, did he violate his own rules? He may have. It was his finest hour. He knew the people were going to vote, and they were going to vote, and we voted. What everybody else said was just pushed aside. He had strength. Uh, <clears throat> another item, I, but at the same time, he knew restraint. When I was elected moderator, he, I, I took the rules. I read through them. I hadn't thought too much about them. Uh, but there was a provision in there that I didn't like. So you know what I did? I took a pen and scratched it out. Gone. A few weeks later, Peter and I were having lunch. For the first couple of years, uh, when I was moderator, we had occasionally would have lunch. And I chatting over things and what went wrong, what went right, the things you might expect. And I told him about it. I expected he might explain to me why he put it in or what it said or what was the value of it. No. He just looked at me and said, they're your rules now, Dennis. He knew how to use restraint. Don't we wish there were more people in public office who knew how to do that? Let me close with a moment that reflects the graciousness of my friend Peter, uh, which was alluded to by, uh, similar to what Richard alluded to, a very gracious man. You see, today, August 11th, is not only Peter's birthday, it is my late mother's 104th birthday. Uh, she was not a big town meeting goer, but she went to town meeting occasionally. She saw what Peter did. She said, how does he ever keep all that in mind? How could he ever do all that? I couldn't possibly do that. I think she thought, didn't think I could do that. But that's mother's for you. At her wake, I was there, and people coming in, and uh, I looked up. And there's Peter and Nancy. I believe Werner and Elaine were there and 
Bonnie, I was moved. They're not of our faith. I don't think Peter ever met my mother. But he took the time, he and the family, took the time to visit with us, to spend a few minutes consoling us as well on, on our loss. Thank you, Nancy. Maybe I'll go one more little story if I could. Because I think you all know Peter and his life story, and you may, you may think that this man could stand by himself and withstand all the whatever the world threw at him and the winds and so forth of, uh, of travail by himself. Let me unmask him. You'd be wrong. He said to me one time, and I'm sure he would want me to say this little story, tell this little story. He said to me one time as we were chatting shortly after I was elected, talked about Nancy. He said, I don't know what I'd do without her. They were together for 60 years. And I don't know what I'd do without her. Nancy, thank you for giving us Peter. So that with that, just a few words to my good friend, the man who set the standard, and I try to keep up with it, as I've said on numerous occasions, publicly. If when I retire, I have one half of the respect that he had, I will be a very successful and happy person. Thank you. Dennis, don't forget your mask. We now have uh, Mr. Michael Wiggins from Weston and Patrick. Is the, he's a colleague of Peter's who worked, works with him. Michael. Thank you. You notice I'm only, excuse me. You notice I'm only wearing a two-piece suit tonight. I'm embarrassed. I don't have any more three-piece suits. Uh, I, but Peter kept them up right to the end. It's been wonderful hearing what Peter meant to this town. It was wonderful at his memorial service, hearing what he meant to his temple and what he meant to his family. I'm here to tell you he also dabbled in the law a little bit. <laughs> maybe not just a little bit. I mean, if he was dabbling in the law, maybe Michael Phelps sort of enjoyed swimming a few laps now and then, or maybe Simone Biles did a few handstands. No, the law was a passion for Peter. He worked the law. He didn't practice law, he worked it. It was rivaled, his passion for the law was rivaled only by the passion he had for Nancy, which we knew uh, we would have social occasions and we would observe how he looked at her and how much fun they were having together. And he would boast about his wonderful relationship and his wonderful children many times. Peter started out uh, after graduating from an obscure uh, law school in, in Cambridge, uh, working for a pretty large firm in Boston, um, Sullivan and Worcester. And in those days, when you started out um, at a large firm, they would rotate you around. You'd, do uh, maybe a, a deed here, go witness a divorce, do a second share in a trial somewhere, uh, maybe get to write a contract or something. But after a year or two, the partners would want to know, well, what are you going to do? For, what are you going to specialize in? Um, and that was the way it was at a big firm. Um, maybe not surprisingly, it was not very long after he had been there for a few years that he left to pursue another opportunity. He started with a, a small group, a three-man law firm. And then, luckily for us, he found his way to Weston Patrick in the early 70s. That was about maybe two or three years before I joined, very wet behind the ears. Um, 
And I, I've, I've never asked him why he left this large law firm with all those opportunities, but I, I'm here to guess anyway. And my guess is that Peter didn't want to specialize. He loved everything about the law. I mean everything. Um, and in the Association of Western Patrick, we don't, we, we work together on, on cases, but we don't tell each other what to do at all. We have our own practices. We're very collegial. We've always had fun. We've been doing it since 1897, so it must be, we must be doing something right. And I think for Peter, there was no constraint. He was free to do what he felt uh, needed to be done and for, the, for his own clients and to follow his own path. His practice was as broad as it gets. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have an older son who just took the bar exam after four months of studying, and he said to me at the end, Dad, tell me why, why did I have to do all this? I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna see what any, most of these questions again in my practice ever. Um, and I'm thinking Peter would have been delighted to take that bar exam over again because he was everywhere. Uh, if you ever saw his website, it looked like uh, the, the website of an 800 person law firm. And I'm just going to read you just briefly the black letter specialties that, that he represented he could help you with. Business, corporate, securities law, personal injury, medical malpractice, matrimonial law, trusts and estates, torts, municipal law, administrative law, estate planning, conservatorships, guardianships, adoptions, civil litigation, appeals in all courts, federal and state and local, election law, real estate, zoning and property disputes, eminent domain, constitutional law, anti-discrimination, and last but not least, immigration, near and dear to his heart, and even criminal law. He was trying a criminal law case a few years ago. He had no business being there, but he prevailed for his client and won a great victory. Did I mention oil and gas tax law? <laughs> I think if, if we had moved our firm to Oklahoma, that could have been added. So, but more important, he didn't just dabble in these areas. When he would take on a case that he wasn't, where he wasn't familiar with the law, he would really go at it and just plunge in. Some of his favorite cases that you know I was lucky enough to hear about, and he would talk about them sometime, would involve taking on a battery of specialists um, on his own. Uh, there was one one thing, I, one case I particularly remember was a will contest in which his client uh, was left something substantial and also a large institution who shall not be named thought that they were owed something and that there had been a breach of contract by the person who died. So they stood up and said, no, no, you don't get that. We, we get that, or we get most of that. And so Peter suddenly was faced with a battery of specialists from a very large law firm, and it went on for several years with motions upon motions. And of course, we would talk from time to time, and he would complain about it professionally. These people are just dragging me down. But between you and me, he was just loving it <laughs> and, and, and just reveling in it. And, and this meant nights and weekends and, yeah, many, many, many too many weekends, I think, for Nancy probably to endure. Um, and, you know, he just was the happier war, happy warrior. He had this kind of dry whistle when he was in the middle of a case. I don't know if you remember it. He'd go <laughs> be walking up and down the hall. And you knew he was on to something really big. But I, I have to think, you know, um, maybe you've seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I certainly remember that. I think about um, them being surrounded by the feds closing in on them up on the bluff somewhere. and. and one of them turns to the other and says, who, who are those guys? And I think about that large law firm and those specialists and one of them saying to each other, who is that guy? <laughs> so legal challenges for many lawyers are, you know, we persevere, we, we slog through, grim-faced, wrestling with 
you know, what we can, you know, try to get to a goal that will help our clients. Um, for Peter, this is brain candy. I mean, he, he just would love those cases and um, just, you know, would be, it would be fun for him. And, you know, we, sometimes I would go to him with my own problems and I'd go in with Thoreau Brown and say, Peter, I've been working on this for several days and what do you think about this? And he was always there with a friendly smile, mostly saying, gee, that looks like fun. You know, you're gonna, that's gonna be a really interesting case, Mike. Uh, let me know how you do. <laughs> In addition to uh, his practice on behalf of his clients, he was an officer of the court and, and really served his profession at large. He was often appointed a receiver or a master by superior court judges who uh, appreciated his bil ability to marshal the facts and get to the point. He served the, the uh, Board of Bar Overseers to hear disciplinary cases. He worked on committees to draft rules. If the law went against him, he would be cheerful about it and, and you know, better luck next time, but also he would be writing articles about the, why the law should be changed. You'd see something in the Lawyer's Weekly maybe a few weeks later about it. A word about his writing and speaking style. Uh, I had the privilege of working with him on briefs from time to time. Peter loved the English language. Uh, he inhaled it, as you well know, from hearing about his story coming over from Germany. And he loved to write. He, his mantra was, omit needless words. Short declarative sentences. No room for a kind of sort of, and I'm sure busy judges, when they got those briefs, were very glad because lawyers tend to overwrite. I'm as guilty as the next person. I would come in sometime with drafts on things we would be working on and he'd say, Mike, that's, I love those ideas. Now, if you could cut that down to maybe a third and you'd still be getting the same point across, then he certainly was right. He also loved books. He fought every time we met as a, as a group. If we weren't planning a social event or arguing about, um, I don't know, uh, the cost of insurance or whatever, he would, any other business, he'd say, well, we need more books in the library. And uh, he lost that battle, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> because, by the, you know, eventually, all of the writings of all of the judges of Massachusetts could be put on one little CD. But Peter kept fighting that battle. And if you, if you went by his office when he was preparing for a trial, you'd see about 30 or 40 Supreme Judicial Court cases with open to pages that were relevant. And he was orchestrating back and forth in a way that a 21-year-old does just with computer screens. But certainly as efficiently and more efficiently in every case. Late in Peter's career, with Nancy's help and maybe indeed urging, Peter learned a strange word called delegate. And he actually started thinking about you know, other people helping him. And I, I had the privilege, among others at the firm, of helping him with cases from time to time. And sort of during the last year he was practicing, he would every week or so he'd send me a list of cases and it started out, you know, cases that he thought he would be passing on and it would probably three or four pages, but then it kept getting smaller and I'd say, well, what about this? I've just been studying this, Peter. He said, oh no, I took care of that. And then it kept getting smaller and now it was down to a single page. It was really getting ridiculous. But that was because of this passion for the law, the passion to do right by his clients and keep going as long as he could do it. Um, there is a poem by William Butler Yeats, I don't know if you've heard, called Sailing to Byzantium. Some people know that. And it starts out with William Butler Yeats, who's only about 60 at the time, bemoaning the fact that he's losing his fastball, so to speak. I, he didn't use that metaphor. Um, and it starts out saying, that is no country for old men. Now, Peter would not have had time to read that. To, to, he wouldn't have, 
really recognize that because he didn't have time to be old, frankly. Uh, he was in midstream, mid-sentence, literally, when he had to stop. Peter set a shining example for all of us to give every case, large or small, the full measure of devotion, even in the rare cases where results didn't turn out as expected, Peter's clients knew that he had given his all to their case. Some of them were the most appreciative, even if they lost. He was a happy warrior. The legal profession was lucky to have him, and we miss him dearly. Thank you. Before we conclude here, I would like to thank the Facilities Department for setting up this room and assisting us and all of my committee members that worked very hard to put this together. And also a big thank you to the Gossels family for providing the nice refreshments. Thank you all. And all, everyone, thank you all for coming and let's joy, enjoy some refreshments. Oh, oh, you know, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself, Nancy. All right, it's all yours. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you, Richard, Cherry, Dennis, and Mike for your beautiful tributes to Peter. I, 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 can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you, Richard, Cherry, Dennis, and Mike, for your beautiful, moving tributes to Peter. I, I'm, I'm deeply moved and so appreciative to be here. On behalf of the entire Gossels family, 22 of whom are here this evening, I want to thank the members of the Public Ceremonies Committee for establishing the C. Peter R. Gossels Good Government Award in Peter's honor. We are also grateful for the unanimous support of the Board of Selectmen and for the support of moderator Dennis Berry. Our family can think of no more fitting tribute to honor Peter's memory. We know he would be deeply moved by this honor as we are. Peter loved Wayland. He loved this town and its town people. And of course, he especially loved our form of town government. He had enormous respect for the many volunteers and committee members who devote their talent and contribute tireless on ours to make Wayland the outstanding place we have in which to live. As many of you know, Peter was an avid student of history. He particularly loved American history, and no story moved him more than the events that occurred in 1775 in Lexington and Concord. No visitor to our home from afar escaped a trip to Lexington Common and the Old North Bridge in Concord, where he so enjoyed retelling the remarkable story that led to our freedom. I would like to end my remarks by reading Peter's own words, which he dictated to me from his hospital bed not long before his death. They were addressed to his physician, whom he had regaled with the story earlier that same day when she had stopped by to visit. His words. In my brief retelling of the events at Lexington and Concord, I neglected to include the most personal bond that I feel to those who fought there. They had for 150 years, the right to govern themselves by town meeting, an institution unknown in England at the time. 
So when the British government decreed they would no longer permit Americans to govern themselves in town meeting, it struck at a fundamental freedom that the colonial people felt was their birthright. And a goodly portion of the colonial population decided that they would no longer be ruled by Parliament and the King of England. And in 1982, the people of Wayland elected this German Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany to be their moderator. And they re-elected me to serve in that capacity for 30 years. So I feel spiritually indebted to those who invested their lives and fortunes to meet the British regulars at Lexington and Concord in order to reestablish and preserve town meeting. The Gossels family thanks you all for being here tonight and for the great honor you bestow upon Peter with your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll try it again. <laughs> I want to thank the facilities department for setting up this room. Uh, I assisted them this afternoon to get it right. And uh, also for installing the portrait and plaque that's up in the hall. Um, also, I want to thank uh, Ryan Keveney from Waycam and also Mark Foreman, the production manager for Waycam for doing the TV production tonight for us. And Cherry Carlson for the selectmen. And I see the chair is here, Tom Fay. And uh, let's have some refreshments and we'll uh, conclude the program. Thank you again for coming. <laughs> <laughs>